for our final chapter. We're going to give a quick summary of what is known about life in our solar system. For all of the hype in movies and elsewhere, we only have firm evidence of life in one place in the solar system, the Earth. So we're going to have to see what our experience with life on Earth can tell us about the possibility of life elsewhere in the solar system. We'll start with a look at the history of life here on Earth. This will give us some important lessons on what to expect if we do find life elsewhere. With the example of the Earth to go on, we'll try giving a definition of what we mean by life and see what this definition implies about the requirements for life. Next, we'll talk about these basic requirements for life. What does it really need to survive on a world? Finally, we'll survey our solar system, looking for likely spots where life might be found today or in the distant past. The Earth is the one place we know life exists. So it's important to see a little bit about the history of life here to figure out what that might tell us about how life might develop elsewhere. The earliest clear evidence we have for life on Earth is in the form of fossilized stromatolites, mats of algae that lived 3.5 billion years ago. There is some evidence for still earlier life, but it's less clear. Certainly, sometime between 3.5 and 4 billion years ago, life first appeared on the Earth. Based on what all life on Earth has in common, we're confident that the earliest life must have been in the form of self-replicating carbon-based or organic molecules, perhaps something like the DNA or RNA found in all living cells. The way a living organism gets its energy is one of the most important characteristics that defines it. For the earliest life, the most likely energy source that would have been available would be the chemical energy stored in compounds in the local environment. There are still many organisms today that rely on this sort of chemosynthesis. Yeasts, for example. Sometime in the early history of life, a new energy source was tapped, the sun. Blue-green algae or some similar organism developed photosynthesis, the ability to convert sunlight into available energy. As a side effect, the Earth's atmosphere began to change. With the abundant carbon dioxide that was in our early atmosphere slowly replaced with oxygen. As we've already seen, this is why the Earth is the only planet with a substantial amount of free oxygen in its atmosphere. As the oxygen became more abundant in the atmosphere between 2 and 2.5 billion years ago, it created a problem for many of the organisms that then existed. Oxygen is so highly reactive that it acted as a poison for much of the life that existed, and it's likely that many organisms were forced into extinction this way. However, the presence of all that oxygen opened up a new way of generating energy, combustion. This is a chemical reaction that relies on the presence of free oxygen reacting with organic chemicals, and it has the potential to release far more energy than either of the earlier options. For this reason, the branch of life we call animals developed with the ability to use oxygen. The extra energy oxygen gives allows even very large animals to move around on their own. For all the time we've looked at so far, all of the living organisms were made up of just single cells. In many cases, those cells lived in colonies together, but they were still separate cells. That changed around a billion years ago, when the first multi-celled organisms appeared on Earth. Since that time, all of the larger organisms we know, from trees to grass to insects, fish, reptiles, and mammals, have appeared from these early multi-celled starting points. What does the history of life on Earth tell us about what to expect of life elsewhere in the solar system? As we answer this, we should keep in mind that we have only one planet's history to go on here, and it's always dangerous to extrapolate from just one example. Until we know if and how life has evolved on many worlds, 
we won't be able to tell what's normal in the way life develops and what is unique to the history of our own planet. Nonetheless, we can try to pull some broad lessons from our planet's history. First, notice that for most of the Earth's history, the most common organisms on Earth were not people or dinosaurs or insects or even plants. Instead, they were single-celled organisms, bacteria, algae, etc. This suggests that if we are looking for life elsewhere, there's a good chance that it will also be in such a simple form. Instead of looking for little green men, we should probably be looking for little green algae. Life on Earth started almost as soon as it was possible for life to exist here. Before four billion years ago, the Earth was still suffering from the same sort of large impacts that produced the giant impact basins on the Moon. Impacts this large would have had enough energy to boil away any early oceans that might have formed and sterilize any early attempts at getting life started. Yet not long after the last of these large impacts, life was well underway on our planet. This may mean that once there are reasonable conditions for life to get started, it is likely to begin quickly. Finally, all life on Earth is related. Biologists can trace the genetic relationships between every species they've studied. This suggests that once life starts on a planet, it quickly takes over and makes it very hard for life to start again. Have a look at this family tree of life. This shows the genetic relationships between major classes of living organisms. It also illustrates the fact that life has been single-celled for most of the Earth's history. The most basic divisions are all between single-celled organisms. All of the larger multi-celled plants and animals are on just a couple of branches in the top left part of the diagram. Here's a matching exercise in which you should see if you can describe how likely it is that a visiting alien would have found different types of life on Earth if they'd shown up at some random point in the planet's history. Make sure you explain each of your choices. Before we can go on to talk about life elsewhere in the solar system, we should address the question of what life is. This will help us figure out what sort of conditions we should be looking for on other worlds to help us decide which ones might be good places to look for life. This is not an easy question to answer. While most people feel they have an idea of what life looks like, when you try to write down a definition that includes the things we would count and leaves out the things we wouldn't, it can be quite tricky. Remember that family tree we just saw. It's not just plants and animals, but includes all those different classes of single-celled organisms. Here's one common definition that works fairly well. You should notice that the definition relies on three key ideas growth through metabolism, reproduction, and adaptation to the environment. The need to meet each of these will put limits on where and how life can develop. For an organism to grow through metabolism, we need two things, a source of energy that allows that growth to occur and the raw materials the organism is made of. Reproduction requires an environment that allows all of the complex chemistry required to occur. As we'll see, on Earth, this means liquid water. Finally, adaptation means that the organism itself has to have some variability in its reproduction. Otherwise, all of its descendants will just be simply copies of itself and won't have any chance to adapt. Since this is more a property of the organism rather than the planet or moon, we won't focus as much on that one here. Now let's look at some of those requirements for life in a little more detail. We're going to start with energy, which is possibly the most basic requirement of all. Just as we've described with atmospheres and planetary geology, living systems depend on how much energy is available and what form it's in. We've also seen that some of the key points in the history of life on our own planet were defined by new ways living organisms developed to get energy. If we look at life on our planet today, 
It turns out that almost all living organisms get their energy from sunlight, one way or another. Of course, we know that plants do this through the process of photosynthesis. But it's important to remember that animals have the same original source for their energy. That's because animals get their energy from eating plants, or from eating animals that eat plants, etc. It may be several steps down the food chain before you come to something that is going through photosynthesis, but almost all living organisms, from amoebas to zebras, get their energy from sunlight. However, there are a few exceptions to this rule. Deep in the oceans, around underwater volcanic vents, like this black smoker at a mid-ocean ridge, we sometimes find whole ecosystems that are built around bacteria that are powered by the chemical potential energy in compounds emerging from the volcano. All of the organisms around these vents are surviving on the energy of the Earth's own internal heat. Remember that the internal heat doesn't depend on sunlight, just on radioactive decay in the Earth's interior. So if somehow the sun were to be shut off, the only living things that would be left on Earth would be found around these hot vents. Of course, when life first started on Earth, it hadn't yet evolved any sort of photosynthesis. So instead, it must also have derived its energy from the chemical potential energy in the environment. In fact, there is some genetic evidence that the bacteria that live around these underwater vents may be the most similar to these earliest life forms of any living organism today. So as we look for life around the solar system, we should think about the sorts of energy sources that are available. Of course, we know that sunlight can be a very good energy source, and there's more of this in the inner than the outer solar system. Anything trying to live at Jupiter's distance from the sun is getting by with 1 25th as much sunlight as the Earth. And by the time you get out to Saturn, it's down to 1 100th. We also know that a world's internal heat can be an important energy source for life. If a world is geologically active, then it can produce the chemicals with enough potential energy to keep organisms alive, like the ones we see around mid-ocean ridges. There are many worlds that are far from the sun, but still geologically active. So this could be an important energy source if there's life in the outer solar system. At the most basic level, all life on Earth is based on the chemistry of the element carbon. In fact, we call compounds made from carbon organic compounds, since for a long time it was assumed that they were only produced by living organisms. There's a good reason why carbon is so important for life. Carbon can bond with up to four other atoms at once, including other carbon atoms. This allows it to build up some amazingly complex compounds very easily. Here are a few examples of some simpler carbon organic molecules that are produced in nature. This sort of complexity is just what a living organism needs to be alive. So carbon is an ideal building material for life. Here is a small piece of one of the most important molecules in living things on Earth, deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA for short. It's made up of a few fairly simple parts, but they're repeated millions of times in a single molecule. This is the molecule that contains the instructions for how to make a living organism. So places that have life should probably have complex organic molecules. Fortunately, organic molecules are very common in some parts of the solar system, especially the outer solar system. Here's a look at the atmosphere of Titan, the largest moon of Saturn. That brown haze that completely covers Titan is made of organic molecules, some of them quite complex. We see signs of complex organic materials on the surfaces or in the atmospheres of many outer solar system worlds. Surprisingly enough, the inner solar system where the Earth is has a lot less organic material. That's partly a matter of history. Organic molecules form from the hydrogen compounds that originally condensed in the outer solar system. 
Hydrogen compounds didn't condense in the inner solar system, so any organic material we find here was probably brought in by comets and asteroids during the late stages of the formation of the solar system. Also, the inner solar system is a harsh environment for organic compounds. High temperatures and ultraviolet and higher energy light from the sun can break up complex organic compounds into much simpler ones. In the inner solar system, there has to be some protection from sunlight. On Earth, this means that all living organisms had to exist in the water until there was enough oxygen in the atmosphere to create ozone and hence a stratosphere. This happened more than 2 billion years after the Earth formed. Once there was a stratosphere absorbing the sun's ultraviolet light, then life could move out of the oceans and onto the land. One of the keys to the sort of organic chemistry that living things on Earth use is that it depends on having a medium in which the organic molecules can move around and interact with each other. On Earth, that medium is liquid water, and the people who look for life on other worlds consider the presence of liquid water to be the most important property for deciding if life is possible. Water has a lot of advantages for life. It's liquid over a fairly wide range of temperatures and pressures. It's also very versatile. An amazing range of organic compounds can dissolve in water, allowing them to interact with each other. And finally, it's much more common than we used to think. For a long time, scientists only looked for signs of liquid water on the surfaces of worlds, like we see here on the Earth. The concept of a habitable zone was developed to indicate the range of distances around a star where liquid water could exist on the surface. In our solar system, the Earth and maybe Mars are within this zone. However, we now realize that liquid water doesn't just have to be on the surface. Remember that water ice is one of the hydrogen compounds that was a major building material for worlds of the outer solar system. In at least some of the Jovian planets, there is liquid water in the form of water droplets suspended in the clouds. Even more promising, many of the moons of these outer solar system worlds have substantial amounts of liquid water below their frozen surfaces. In some cases, such as Europa shown here, there are oceans under the icy crusts that have more liquid water than in all of the oceans on Earth. So now that we're not just looking at the surfaces of planets, we realize that liquid water can be fairly common. We know that all life on Earth depends on liquid water, but it's worth speculating on the possibility that some other liquid could fill the same role. There are a few common compounds that form liquids and might also be able to act as a medium for organic chemical reactions. These are the hydrogen compounds, methane and ethane, which are made from hydrogen and carbon, and ammonia, which is made from hydrogen and nitrogen. Currently, we're not sure of any locations with liquid ammonia, but we do see lakes of liquid ethane and methane on the surface of Saturn's largest moon, Titan. Both of these sets of compounds are liquids at much lower temperatures than water is, so they open up the possibility of living organisms at temperatures where water is frozen solid. However, they're also liquid over a narrower range of temperatures, so conditions have to be much more stable than they do for liquid water. At the moment, we have no idea if life-supporting organic chemistry can happen in compounds like liquid ethane. It's simply too different from how such chemistry works in water for us to be able to predict if it's possible or not. However, if it is possible, then the range of places where life could exist would expand significantly.